a uh, mechanical wolf creature for an M.I. Shyamalan film. And I'm using the control software that I've been working on, some of the mechanical ideas I've got working on. And in this way, I have been building a, a toolkit of um, techniques and resources that I apply to my work from one project to another. And this is what I'm known for in my niche, Hollywood. So when a, uh, a couple of uh, Hollywood producers had an idea for a TV show with giant fire robots, they called me up. So we teamed up and we created Robot Combat. In our first meeting, I drew a sketch, uh, something to just get the vibe of what I thought the robots were going to be like. I think a lot about cars when I think about the robots. I think about like, like imagine a tiny big motorcycle. And just the feeling of it's it's an artwork, but it's also very technological. And you can see the technology, but you can also see the craft. And this was the, the beginning of that. But this sketch wasn't going to sell the show to the executives at Sci-Fi. This was going to be a very expensive show to produce. And they needed something more than just a sketch of that an envelope to convince them that it was going to work. It was a very audacious project. So I had to build a prototype. So I began working on a prototype robot, which I called Hades. <coughs> now, Hades is hydraulic. This is actually my first hydraulics project. So I had a lot to learn, which is kind of the theme of this. Hydraulics, basically in the context of a robot like this, uh, work with, you have a huge pump that's providing high pressure fluid, and it gets pumped up into the robot, and it goes through a manifold, and it controls the valves and the, and the cylinders. And a lot of people ask me, when you're making something like this, and it's a humanoid thing. Where do you start? Where do you start the design process? And for me, because it's a human, and because it's so complex, the design process goes into the process of elimination. The human body has hundreds and hundreds of muscles, and it cannot be reproduced completely. So the question is, what do you leave out? What is the minimum number of joints and muscles that you can use to make a robot that can walk and punch? The number I came up with was 22. So with 22 hydraulic actuators, I can make a machine that will do what I want it to do. And that was my starting point of the design. So I started basically the heart of the robot. The heart of the robot is something we call a manifold. And you might wonder what manifold is. Well, a hydraulic system relies on, as I said, fluid pressure and hydraulic actuators. But the thing that makes a hydraulic actuator, which is just a, it's just a tube with a piston in it, and depending on which direction the fluid is flowing, the piston will either go one way or the other. But what makes it work with precision, what makes it a circle, is the valve. And I had to cram 22 of these things into the chest of this robot. So the manifolds you can buy, which is the thing that you screw the valve onto, it's just a block. If you want five, you have one that's about this long. If you want 20, it has to be about this long. It's not going to work. I can't fit that in my robot. So I had to design my own manifold. And I decided to design one in the shape of a circle so that I could arrange the valves in a circle and I have a hole in the center for my internal computer. So the manifold has channels inside that distribute the fluid and it has places for the hoses to attach and the valves. And basically it's like a big carousel, except instead of ponies, it has military grade circle hydraulic valves. So, <laughs> With the manifold worked out, the next step is to start working on the skeleton. The skeleton of the robot is made of aluminum, and I basically use two techniques to make these parts. Some of the parts are machined with a CNC machine, like the knee joints, places where there's tapered roller bearings, places where it has to be very precise. And then there are also large plates that are covered with water jet. Water jet cutting is fairly expensive. You can cut through very, very thick metal and make a lot of stuff very quickly. So these pieces all get bolted together, and there's hundreds of screws. And in developing the skeleton, I, I chose to use aluminum because I wanted to be able to have the opportunity to make mistakes and make changes as I went along. And with aluminum, I can drill more holes, pull pieces off, remake them, stick them back on again. At the same time as I'm working on the skeleton and the overall structure of the robot, I'm also thinking about control. How does the control system work? How am I going to make this thing move? Now, the walking is controlled by a joystick or a set of joysticks. But this thing is going to have arms. So how am I going to control those? So, you know, maybe I could do something off the shelf. But, I 
in my opinion, the way to something control a, a robot that's a complex human, a human robot, is to use what I call a representational controller. Um, Robert Heinlein would call this a wall -out. What this controller and robot combination is doing is it's, it's very, very intuitive to learn. The controller is mechanically identical to the robot. It has joints, the same number of joints. The joints have the same geometric relationship to each other. So when you move the controller around, the robot, there's, there's nothing um, left to chance. It works, it works exactly the way you expect it will. And so I built something like this for the RCL robots. So the RCL robots have kind of a funky shoulder joint, but because the geometry of the controller is exactly the same as the geometry of the robot, I can get really predictable results out of the movement of that shoulder. So I've got the skeleton basically designed. I've got the torso worked out. The torso is a six-axis motion base. And now it's time to start to putting some sheet metal on the top round. The chassis is done, and I want to start making some, some body panels. So let's start, let's start with the thigh. Now one of the differences between a robot like this and something that I might think of in the movie industry is that in the movies you can make stuff out of plastic or fiberglass or really whatever. You can paint it to look like it's real metal, but this thing actually has to be real steel. So if you take a look at the thigh, this is how it begins. This is a, a CAD model. And what I, what I do is I model the, the shape of the outline in the inventor, and I bring it into this program called Nano, which will take a surface model and shred it out into flat pieces. So one of the rules of the design of this is that there's no surface on this thing that cannot be unfolded into a flat shape. So although it looks very organic and smooth, it can be done with flat pieces. These pieces get rolled, and they get tacked together, welded together, and you wind up with a really nice looking piece. And there's something like 27 weldments, different pieces that comprise the feet, the shins, and the thighs, the backs of the thighs, and the torso, and all different parts of the robot, the head. All these things get made, they get welded together, and they turn into the final, the final robot. So when Hades basically constructed through the design process to the finished, to finish them, which I was then able to demonstrate to the Sci-Fi Network. And they liked it, and they decided to green light the show. The, uh, the real work now had to begin. That process took four months, from basically starting to where we demoed the final robot, was a four month build. Now, I had another four months to build 12 more, which is ridiculous. I began by recreating the skeleton of Hades. Uh, made a few modifications and then went into mass production. And in mass producing the skeleton, I went through, we basically made hundreds of parts. Um, I have my own CNC machine, and it was running full time for, for weeks, making all the pieces that we needed for all the robots for the show. There's 122 uh, hydraulic cylinders. Um, these are sub assemblies going together. Thousands of screws went together. Things. But honestly, this wasn't the hard part of the job. The hard part of the job was coming up with the 12 unique character designs that were going to appear in the show. Because each robot is a one-of-a-kind artwork. It's not mass-produced. It's a, it's a single special character. So to design those, I started with a rendering of the skeleton. I had three graphic designers that were working with me on the designs of the robots. And I would give them these, and they would, sorry, they would then do the robot designs on top of that. It's a little crude, but it really gave us a, a somewhat of an assurance that whatever they were designing was going to work mechanically with the skeleton that we were, we were doing. And then this design process began. And we went through many, many different iterations of robot designs. Now, when I thought about these designs, like I said before, I'm thinking about cars. I, there have been so many cool robots science fiction, movies, and things that we've, we've seen before. I really wanted to think of it from the terms of vehicle design. And all the things that we have fun with with cars, we soup them up, we chrome them out, we give them hot paint jobs, we dress them up in the Jolibre masks. Which we're going to make it in the, in the final cut, but maybe season two. So, 
how you get from a two-dimensional drawing to a full finished robot uh, is a process that is fairly time consuming. So I split that job up into several different groups. The first was to basically do the same thing I did in 80s, where each robot is completely designed in CAD. And then we go through the whole process of taking those individual parts, shredding them into flat pieces, having those pieces cut on a water jet, welding them together, finishing them, painting them, putting the RGB LED systems into them, and now you're ready to assemble this on with the robot. But I didn't have time to do all of the robots that way. So I had one team, for example, that was just doing the carbon fiber robot. I had one team that was just doing the steel and leather robot. <clears throat> Here's some more cab work. This is, this is draw -strike. Now, for this robot, and for several others, instead of using a computer to make a full-scale robot, we actually did full-scale lockups on the phone. Now this guy, Fred Fridley, is a, uh, he's a fabricator. And he normally makes creatures of the film industry like I do. And one of the challenges of his job was to take uh, people that I trust, people who I know can really get the work done, and kind of pull them out of their comfort zone and say, OK, Fred, we're not going to be working. We're going to work on phone, but the final product is actually steel. I said, no, this isn't what you normally work with, but I, I trust you, and you can actually do this. So Fred would bang out these incredible phone lockups. And then we would take these three-dimensional shapes and turn them over to a metal fabrication shop. And the fabrication shop would then use that as a guide to recreate it in steel. And they could use whatever techniques they would normally use. I had two different shops doing that for me. This company did uh, this robot as well as Steampunk. And then and there's Steampunk. And then I had another friend of mine, Todd Farron, who did the roll cage for Crash, and he also did Axe. Now, Axe was actually the first robot that we completed in the shop. And it was a hybrid. A lot of it was done in foam. There were certain parts like the elbow that I did in the cab because it had to be very precise. Recreated by Todd at the shop with steel. And then it was the first time we saw a finished robot actually marching around in the shop. And that moment is, wow, it's, uh, it's very gratifying when you work that hard on something and you finally get to see a little bit. Um, I've, uh, I've got some time to answer questions. I've kind of blown through a lot of this. Okay. Yes, okay. In the show.